If we come to the scriptures with the mentality that the Bible is inspired by God, it is truly God speaking through people. It's truly been guided by God and protected by God throughout the centuries. And when we open up that book and we believe with our hearts full commitment that the word of God is doing something to us, Hebrews 4.12, it's living and active, is doing something to us every time you read it. And that the intent of God's love, because God loves us, the intent of God's belief in us, because God believes in us, the intent of God's faith in us being able to fulfill the destiny he's given us, these things will allow us to live a life of impact. I don't think there's anyone on earth who doesn't want to have a sense of purpose, that doesn't want to know their why, that doesn't want to have that intentionality to life where they feel like they're gonna make an impact. Our ambitions may vary. Some people may wanna make an impact just on their family and their kids and their friends. Some people may wanna make an impact on their high school or their middle school. Some people may wanna make an impact at their college, or some may make an impact in a particular cause that they have that's unique to them because they grew up in poverty, or they grew up amidst a lot of racism, or they grew up where women were not allowed to have a lot of opportunity. But no matter who we are, we're all looking for a way to make an impact. And it's important to know this, that whatever God has planted in your heart as a way to make impact, your and my greatest impact will be made when we bring the gospel to people. And the gospel is basically, in a nutshell, Jesus dying on a cross, giving up his life, being resurrected so that all of our sins could be forgiven and we could take hold of a destiny that God has been keeping for us. It's a destiny that's about purpose, it's a destiny about sacrifice, and it's a destiny about changing the lives of those around us as our life is changed. And that's why I want to talk about Jesus for a minute and about how he had a life of impact. Jesus lived an inspiring life. In Mark chapter 7 and verse 36, it says, after doing an amazing miracle, Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone, but the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. Y'all know about you, but if, it was, if I did a miracle, if I could do miracles like Jesus, I'd be shouting, I'd be doing commercials at the Super Bowl. I'd be on a commercial talking about it. He didn't want to focus on him. He wanted to focus on God. He wasn't trying to get people to pay all this attention to him. He was trying to get people to see God by seeing him. In verse 37, they were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. They were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. Jesus lived an inspiring life. You may say, well, I can't do miracles. Yes, you can. I've seen miracles take place in my life. I have two sons with special needs and we just started doing a little soccer thing, inclusive soccer, having some of their typical friends come and helping them learn soccer, but more importantly, build friendships that would last a lifetime. And now it's gone to thousands and thousands of people around the world in all different kinds of sports and wards have been won, national recognition, all kinds of amazing things happen. And it's impacted society and the way that society includes special needs kids today and adults. And the emphasis is still on integrating typical children with special needs kids on the soccer field. Miracles happen every day when we help people and we change their lives. We can change lives just like Jesus did, but the key is when people who know us meet us and are around us, they go, everything that that person's done is wonderful. And what makes it wonderful? There's wonder to it. I can't believe you made that sacrifice to help someone you didn't know. I can't believe you gave up your time to go and serve and give to those people. I can't believe you're interested in me and interested in talking to me. That's the story of every person who would believe in God and want to be like Jesus. You know, that's the way I met the church for the first time. The first people I met were just so inspiring to me. They were authentic. They were transparent. They had a sense of purpose. They cared more than most people cared to care. And I became inspired because I saw that this could only come through having a relationship with God. This could only come through reading the scriptures and obeying them. This could only come through having a sense of mission that was aligned with God's purpose for their life. I had a Church of Christ background. Church of Christ currently, as of 1990, had 1 1.7 million people. Today, it's about 1. 
one eight million, maybe a little lower. And one of the things that happened to Church of Christ was a great church is division. And division is dangerous because guess what? The more divided we become, the less inspiring we become as Christians. I, I used to say, why would I believe in a Christianity when they don't even all agree with each other? And this is a burdensome thing because there's really deep explanations for some of this. But I remember when I began to study and look at the Church of Christ and I learned oh, there's premillennial churches of Christ. They believe Jesus has returned before the millennium. They're non-class churches of Christ that are against Bible classes. One cup churches of Christ that are against using multiple cups for communion and believe you should only drink out of one. There's anti-institutional churches of Christ that don't believe in supporting colleges, orphanages, or missions. There's the white church of Christ that still today there are churches of Christ that are just white people People, and there's African-American Church of Christ. And it's gotten a little better, but you can read and you can learn. It's still an issue, not only in the Church of Christ, but in all kinds of churches where still what Martin Luther King used to say is true. The most separated moment in America every week is the hour that Americans go to church together. Why am I bringing this up? I think Church of Christ is great, but I think one of the challenges I saw was division and that division diminishes the inspiration. There's a book called A Prophet Without Honor. It's about Billy Graham, written by William C. Martin. And he speaks, Billy Graham speaks, about all of churches. And he points out the danger of this division thing. In his keynote address, which some associates have characterized as the most carefully crafted presentation of his career, Graham observed that the decline of evangelism in liberal churches could be traced to three primary causes. When we live an inspiring life, we're essentially being evangelistic. We're reaching out to a world that needs hope and we're giving it to them. We're reaching out to a world that needs purpose and we're giving it to them. We're reaching out to a world that needs love and we're giving it to them. We're reaching out to a world that needs faith and we're giving it to them. As people are bombarded on social media and television and all kinds of streaming media with negative images and negative thoughts, they get depressed, they get discouraged, they get down, they get defeated. I know I get that way. And we need someone and something to come into our life. And that's evangelism. We talked about that in previous episodes, that it's okay to be someone who's out there trying to take good and God into a world that's dark and discouraging. But Billy Graham writes and says, I've seen three primary causes why the church stops being a light, why it stops making that difference. And, and, and I'm not saying all churches are bad. I think I go to a great church. I think a lot of us go to great churches, but sometimes we can get off and we can get divided and we can begin to fight against each other instead of saying, you know what, these things shouldn't even become issues because our primary issue is being the light in a dark world. What were the three primary causes Graham talked about? He goes on, same book, the loss of confidence in the Bible and thus in the authority of the gospel message, preoccupation with social and political problems particularly at the leadership levels of denominations and interchurch agencies, and greater concern with an artificial organizational unity with unity that develops naturally around a common task, specifically evangelism. And so if I've confused you or myself, let me run them down. Three reasons, the three key reasons why the church stops being an inspiration, why it stops being evangeliz evangelistic, the loss of confidence in the Bible, meaning the loss of confidence that taking the gospel to people will actually change the world. Well, number two, preoccupation with social and political problems, losing focus on how you solve problems in the world and starting to go to the humanistic path instead of the spiritual path, and a greater concern with an artificial organizational unity than with the unity that develops naturally around a common task, specifically evangelism. Meaning a lot of times Christians aren't into the division. The average Christian isn't in losing confidence in the Bible, but the people people in leadership are. They are not understanding that the power of living an inspiring life comes from being unified and becoming like Jesus individually and becoming like the church in the New Testament. He's saying when we want to hold on to our preferences more than we want to hold on to our conviction that we're here to save and change the world and make lives better, then we will end up putting away advances completely and we will not have any kind of unity at all. This is an important thing because it's something the New Testament church didn't lose. The New Testament church imitated the impact of Jesus because it didn't violate those three things. The New Testament church 
did not lose its confidence in the Bible. It held strong on its confidence in the Bible. It did not become preoccupied with humanistic solving of problems and social and political problems. It stayed focused on understanding that gospel actually changes lives and hearts, and that's what solves social and political problems. And it stayed unified because it kept a hold of its purpose. Instead of trying to be unified around we're the same church, we're the same denomination, we like the same music, we're all the same color, it became unified around we're out there to save, serve, and change lives. And look at what it says in Acts 5 verse 12. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. One of the things you see in the Bible from the very beginning is these New Testament Christians, they were stuck together. They loved each other. They sacrificed each other. They served each other. They were the most unified group the world had ever seen. Verse 13, no one else dared join them even though they were highly regarded by the people. You know what, they had a level of commitment that people were like, I'm not sure I can get to that level of commitment. But even though people were afraid of that level of commitment, they had great respect for them, great regard for them. But even though the standard was high, the regard for them was so great. They were so inspiring that verse 14, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. You know what, God's church should be growing and thriving because it's inspiring. Jesus was inspiring, the New Testament church was inspiring, and we should be inspiring, and we should do away with anything that keeps us from being inspiring, including losing our heart for inspiration through evangelism. That's been One Quick Thought.